two. One. And just waiting for it to go down. Isn't it, isn't it live? Yeah, Hello, live. ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to We're live now. Inside Movies <laughs> Galore. I am one of your hosts as we are continuing our themed uh, uh, monthlies. Ah, here we go. Welcome back to Inside Movies Galore. I'm Take your host, uh, one of your hosts. Uh, we were waiting for uh, for the numbers to start rolling. So uh, um, we are back with the theme of non-comic book. Non-superhero comic book movies. Based uh, on Western comics. So tonight we are continuing our Judge Dredd filmography. As we uh, we are talking about Judge uh, 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 Judge Dredd, uh, Dredd's character adaptation of Dredd in two, uh, yeah. 2012. So yeah. take it away, Forrest. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, all right. So tw- so ju- so for uh, Dredd 2012, uh, Dredd 2012, uh, directed by it was directed by Pete Travis and stars Carl stars Carl Urban in the title role, uh, taking over from Sylvester Stallone. With Olivia Thirlby as uh, rookie as rookie Judge Anderson, mm-hmm. and Lena Headey, uh, Game of Thrones as Lena Headey as the villain Mama, and the plot and the and the plot synopsis in a violent futuristic city, uh, Mega City One, where the police have, have the authority to act as judge, jury, and executioner. A uh, ju- uh, cop, Judge Dredd, teams with a trainee, uh, Anderson. To take down a get to take down a gang that deals the rea- deals the reality altering drug slow mo. All right, and uh, so I'm gonna, gonna go around and do do uh, first impressions uh, clockwise. Uh, clockwise. So, uh, Dave, uh, is this your first time watching Dread? And what were you, what was your impression of it? Your this is definitely impression? not my first time watching it. It's uh, probably my third. Um. Uh, uh, mainly because, uh, because even though, uh, though I know a lot of people know uh, know Judge Dredd for uh, uh, for a, f- a film, I actually like this adaptation better. Um, I, uh, maybe that may may not be be the uh, uh, opinion of others, but uh, but uh, it is what is, and uh, I can I bought this when it came, it came out to DVD. I didn't see this in th- uh, uh, theaters. Uh, but um, I really liked it. Uh, I mean, I thought I, I thought it was a pretty good adaptation of what uh, what I thought Judge uh, uh, Dredd should be. Uh, be. I loved that the that the uh, costumes were toned down. I didn't like the flashiness of the, uh, uh, of the uh, the original, even though I liked it better in the, uh, uh, the flashiness better in the game. I don't know. It just didn't look, uh, uh, look as well on screen the, the first time I saw the original Judge Dredd. But that being sa- uh, 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 said, I like uh, I like the sleekness of the bike, uh, 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 the fact that it's a little thinner, not so broad span. Um, and uh, there's an interesting aspect to the si- uh, 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 to uh, having a uh, having a dread with uh, um, psychic abilities. So I thought that was kind of cool. So. Another uh, another uh, judge that has psychic abilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because so, if uh, Dredd had psychic abilities, oh man, that would be something. <laughs> but um, it was definitely a different ju- uh, judge. I thought he was a much more stiffer. Um, uh, uh, but. Uh, it is what it is. So, uh, so I thought it was a relatively enjo- uh, enjoyable f- uh, film. Although, I wonder what this film would have been like if I'd have seen it on acid. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right, uh, Brandon, is this your first? Uh, what was uh, your 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 first impression? Is this your first time seeing Dread? Uh, no. Um, I. Was uh, introduced to this again. I was a fan of the comics and uh, a fan of the original film at the time, and 
much like any uh, any fan of any type of film, when, they, when you see it first, it sometimes takes a moment uh, to adjust to a new take on things, uh, so to speak. And uh, this one, I, I had been looking forward to trying to see a Judge Dread revival. Looking at it um, more from uh, my now perspective to when I saw it then, then I, I, I admit, I looked at it as like, this is more of the same schlock that, much like, much like uh, was said about the previous one, uh, where it felt like a lot of the action movies of the time. This one also, to me, felt like all the action movies and remakes of the time. So I was not as impressed by it, but at the same time, watching it now, uh, you know, again, I feel that I like it about on par with the other film, and uh, I look at them as different in, in a way, sort of like a different era of each of the comics, whereas... Um, Whereas I look at Judge Dredd as more of a kind of a an arc, which would involve multiple issues, I would involve I would look at this as a single issue story. So that would be my thoughts. Interesting, uh, Jake. Is this your first? Is um what uh, is this your first time watching Dredd? And what was your impression? Of it? This was my first time watching it, and. Uh... And again, I did read it. I did go into this with uh, mostly incidental knowledge of the character and series. Uh, I watched this first of the two movies, and so it was the one I got the stronger impression on. I One thing we neglected to mention with the other one is apparently it was the first movie that, at least according to IMDb, was the first one tied directly to a video game release in some ways. And I oh, yeah. do think I played that game back in the day. I could be wrong, but I feel like it. I probably played it a couple times. So the, I don't think I was completely clueless on Judge Dredd. Let's put it that way. But this was definitely my first time sitting down and watching it. Um, I And I had heard when it came out. I, I noticed all the buzz about how it was so different from the other one and you know, all that stuff. And it is. <laughs> Having seen them both, they are completely different creatures. And a comment that came up in our chat, which is appropriate, and it's even in more interesting and more appropriate that they came out the same year, is that this has a lot in common structurally with a movie we discussed a few months back, The Raid Redemption. There's a lot structurally that's very similar, and I personally love The Raid, so I was able to kind of look at this and go, ah, I see. Okay, I see that as some similarity, and I, I like Carl Urban. Uh, I I like Lena Headey a lot, and and uh, Olivia Thirlby. And uh, generally, it got much bloodier than I wanted. <laughs> Y'all know that. Y'all know I don't. Uh, you know the part where the skinned corpses are thrown over the railing. Uh, I was looking like uh, they didn't really show you a whole lot of it. Yeah. They don't show you a lot. But well, they, and they I didn't know they, make you hungry. They could have gone. It could have been <laughs> a lot worse. It could have been a lot worse, and I know this. Um, but I do think that uh, all things considered, I'm glad I finally got to see both movies, and um, generally give them a decent rating. <laughs> this one definitely is a lot more serious. That's mm -hmm. a lot more serious. <laughs> okay uh dustin uh is this your first time watching dread what was your impression of it your first impression mm -hmm. well um i first saw this so a long time ago i used to survive by reselling movies and mm -hmm. this is one of those few movies that i bought it to sell and i ended up liking it so much that i kept it mm -hmm. uh, so this was back in 2012, 2013-ish, when it was fairly new. Um, so I've seen this movie a few times, and I really enjoy it. Like, it's a very good uh, action movie. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it is very similar to the raid. Um, I'd say this is definitely the better Dread Judge Dread movie. Um, like I think hands down. Uh, so I have a very positive opinion of this movie. So <laughs> I I always recommend it if it comes up in conversation. Hmm. All right, and uh, Dane, uh, for, uh, it's your first time watching Dread, and what was your imp- what was your first impressions of it? Yeah, first time watching this, and I watched it right after the other one, and uh, I will say that uh, I concur with the consensus that this is overall a better movie. There were definitely, I did agree with Brandon that there were some things that the other one did either better or good in a different way like specifically with the world building which is not to say that this did this poorly did the world building poorly it just it's one of the just because of the story it's thrusting you right into the action and you know minimal exposition and you just go which is um it's a strength and a weakness i think overall it's a strength for the sake of the story because it does not bog you down with a lot of useless details uh and it doesn't overstuff it. It just really gets you straight into the action. Um, well, now we did well, we we did see the exposition and the world building handled pretty well in the other one, uh, in the same uh, approximately the same story length. So my, that's if it were like an overly long, overly stuffed movie, then I might have said, "Oh yeah, lean and mean, get right into the action." But the other one fleshed it out pretty quickly uh, also in a very similarly economic span of time. Um, So it can be done. Now, granted, that's not the story that's being told here. This is a very just simple, like, the final boss is up at the top of the tower, so we got to ascend to Mm -hmm. get her. You know, that's uh, what this is. And so as an economical action movie, it handles that really, really well. You do still get a sense that this is a world that is... uh, totalitarian in its structure you get more of a sense that this is like overrun with crime and drugs and that kind of stuff in a way that you didn't really get to see as much with the other one because the other one was a bit more you know big dumb 90s action movie uh you know with lots of cool cars and cool things that we can make into toys you really get the sense here because they shot this in i want to say johannesburg at least largely uh you get yeah, Johannesburg, South Africa. You get the idea that uh, this is a place that's really overrun with crime and is in need of these kinds of lethal enforcers, um, which, again, s- similar to, like, District 9 also shot in and set in Johannesburg. Um, you know, similar, like, social crises and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I think it was done very effectively. I like the lead performances. I think Carl Urban definitely plays the role more seriously, and he's playing Dread. They're not having to retrofit the role to fit Stallone or fit a Mm -hmm. star that's established. He's playing a character, and he's doing it completely uh, without taking off his mask or doing any of the usual stuff. I mean, most actors wouldn't have the humility or the self-confidence or the you know just the commitment right. to doing that and he did it all the way his particular take on dread is clearly influenced by clint eastwood um right. but that works uh that works for me i like lena Hetty a lot i like her in general and i was really glad to see olivia thurlby uh because i knew her from juno and i love juno mm-hmm. uh, but it was cool to see her in a more action-oriented movie and with a bigger role um, so I, I, I thought overall, yeah, it was a stronger movie, uh, just cause it did take itself more seriously and it accomplished what it set out to be. Uh, mm-hmm. I do think because of its smaller scale that, you know, and it, it had, it, it made good use of its lower budget and, uh, lower mm-hmm. relatively speaking, it was like about mid, mid, low, mid level, you know, uh, but I think it made effective use of its budget. It used, seemed like it used a lot of real locations when it could. And uh, yeah, I thought it was very good. I just remember hearing about this movie from a lot of YouTubers that I, like a lot of people that like to do Blu-ray unboxings and movie reviews and stuff. And they uh, they absolutely creamed their panties over this movie. They absolutely <laughs> loved it. And I wouldn't, quite go like i i thought it was really really good really solid 
I I didn't like love either movie uh, necessarily. I mean, I, I thought they were incredibly effective for what they were trying to be. They're just trying to be completely different things. I think for what this movie's going for, it most definitely accomplished it. Um, I just like that it wasn't afraid to be violent. It wasn't afraid to be uh, really uncompromising in its vision, really just slick and efficient, 90 minutes, you know, get in, get out, don't waste time, just like their mission, mm -hmm. you know, don't waste time. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was pretty darn good for what it was. Mm -hmm. good. All right. And, uh, okay, so for me, this is not my first time watching it. Um, I actually, call, actually, um, well, by, by the time this was was already in uh, filming, you know, in production, I had already become, a, I had already gotten into the Judge Dredd comics. And uh, I remember, I remember following, kind of fo uh, following, uh, like, production, like, production on it, like, looking, you know, anytime, uh, like, any production stills, new, any press releases, on it, uh, I caught it in a Thursday night screen in a in an early Thursday night screening in 3D because it was originally shot in you know shot for 3D. Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely tell. Definitely, yeah. um, and it's one of the, yeah probably one of the few few movies that it was actually worth paying to see in 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely you know, I definitely agree you know, I definitely agree with a lot of what's been said. You know, it's you know even though it's a small even though it's definitely got more of, it's more of the raid die hard. Compare, where like whereas whereas the original movie was not was a lot bigger in scope, like you know it's good this it could have been a, like a more of a story arc. Whereas like Brandon was saying, this one definitely feels more like a self contained could have been a single issue story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know with this whole with this whole raid die hard setting, which actually could, was not actually anticipating, but I guess it should have given that it had a lower budget and you know the production you know it but you know, like even with a lower budget and you know the production value wasn't quite what was about. Half, you know, the budget was about half of what the original was. It still made a lot. They still made a lot, made the most mm -hmm. out of it. Um, actually, one thing I do notice about both movies is they're very economical. Oh, I know. Storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like they make the most of their time. They make the most of their, of their short, of their short run times. Right. Yeah. Well, and I guess, I guess that's kind of where I would give the points just slightly to Judge Dredd as far as they managed to flesh out a lot of world building into a very short amount of time. Whereas like this film, it's more concerned with thrusting you right into the action. Yeah. And it, now it does that very, very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. I'm not knocking it. I'm just more impressed yeah. that a world that big and that detail could have been expounded yeah. upon in roughly the same amount of time. Yeah, I and can I was... easily see this as a sequel to the original film mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. many ways. Uh, with the other one establishing Dread, and this one, well, Dread's already established. Let's move on yeah. to the world. Yeah. Uh, that that being said, that being said, I'll mention as someone who, again, this was their first prolonged exposure. I did not feel lost. I felt like I knew yeah. what was going on. So they did a pretty good job of setting the world, but I do agree that the other movie did a really good job of expanding upon that. Yeah. Well, the the other one gave you more of like the socio political climate beyond right. just crime and drugs, which is really all that you care about here. But it gave you the larger picture to it all. Mm -hmm. uh, but this this one's more much 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 more effective at down and dirty like this is what the life of a street judge would be like you know mm -hmm. right and um also carl like carl Irvin, i feel like, i feel like um i i feel like this one was definitely more true in spirit to the comics i mean you don't mm -hmm. you, know, you don't you don't you never see his face without the helmet um mm -hmm. and, you know you brought you know dane you brought up how, about how he's channeling clint, clint eastwood which mm -hmm. is interesting since uh D dirty harry was the primary inspiration for the dread character to be get to, uh with his initial uh concept with his uh initial conception oh yeah mm -hmm. well and, and dirty harry when that film came out dirty harry the character was criticized for being like a fascist Fascist. wet dream uh and so then <laughs> then the creators of judge dread the comic uh, john wagner and carlos s escura um yes, Escura. 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 
Well, that's what I mean. It's like they, because yeah. that was meant to be a criticism of America. And so they're like, we're just mm -hmm. going to take that and run with it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and yeah, we're going to yeah. make it an actual, an actual fascist wet dream, you know? But, uh, you know, but I just find that amusing. But the, the thing oh. that makes this effective, uh, you know, like, because the other one I liked for how much it got across on a kind of socio-political level, albeit in a cheesy, big, dumb action yeah. movie kind of way, but it managed to get a lot done in a little time. Oh. What's different here though, is that you do, because it's so down and dirty, this is like a day in the life of a street judge. You yeah. do feel more, I would dare say, you feel more compassion for the street judges, or at least the two that we follow. You mm -hmm. feel more compassion for them than you do for any of the ones in the first one. Uh, because right. it's much more of like, this is what you might encounter. And this is them trying to do their job amidst all of these, you know, slum lords and, you know, drug addicts and all these people that are just really mm -hmm. unsavory people. Another film that I read was apparently an inspiration on this one was Training Day. And there's definitely a little bit of an element of that to the yeah. script as well. With, uh, Drake and, uh, yeah. Well, and to me, I look at this and I, I can I, I look at it and I, I see this one and I don't really see either one being a, a fully accurate representation of the comic. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like a lot of the, there is some of the satire, there is some of it there, yeah. but a lot of the tongue in cheek, a lot of the stuff is gone. It's uh, much more bland. And a lot of that is, again, when we talk about the uh, big dumb action movie, of the 90s this was the equivalent big dumb action movie of the time that mm. this was done as well, well this, this is this is more everything yeah, this needs is, to be yeah this is on. like the, have, the grim and gritty go ahead that's the idea is that everything has to be dark gritty broody this was the dark night time period this is the right. if, it's, if it's not drab dreary violent edgy Mm -hmm. it's not good it's just uh, no it's bad you got to go this way so again gotta, it's about a reflection of the time and humor and dark comedy all the time <laughs> that's, i'm not that's sure I would, it's all about that uh it's all about the time reflection it i'm really not sure is. i would i would not sure i would argue that that makes this bland or dumb uh no i mean but, it's <laughs> no more than i don't really consider the original bland or dumb uh, well, but they're so, they're representative yeah. of their times, like you yeah, said. They're representative of yeah. their time. I'm just using the uh, the reference of big dumb mm -hmm. action movie that was utilized for the first mm -hmm. one as yeah. a concept. That's what I mean when I say that. Yeah, well, but it, it, it could I have been a, it could have been a lot dumber. I'll give you that. Yeah, sure. if I think big dumb action movie from the time period, I think about that other movie that Peter Travis did that was kind of a big dumb action movie. Which was Vantage Point. I'm sorry, I did not care for Vantage Point oh, one that bit. Was 2008. But that I was, that. Uh, but apparently in this one, the writer Alex Garland took over in the editing workshop, and Carl Urban has straight said that Alex Garland directed the film. Uh, but Garland, of course, would go on to write and direct Ex Machina, which was a a brilliant piece of. Uh, of um what do we trying to say an exercise in budget and restraint in trying to sell a, an action movie and, again, and I, so, well, consider this, I still consider that? this a present day this was done yeah. what, you said 2012 ish 2000 yeah. is when this came out 2012 yeah, so yeah. i still consider this uh keep in mind we are like 20 years removed almost from uh the original judge dread oh more than 20 when we are oh, when we're 20 years, years when we're 20 years uh removed from this movie then yeah. we'll, we'll look back and see how it is because now we kind of look at that as well are this is will? the end thing this is the end way of doing it this is hmm. the art of the time so this is awesome this is fashionable this is this is yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm with you. I am with you though because I did sort of criticize everybody trying to copy the Dark Knight. Um, right. And it's grim and gritty. We have to be yeah. dour. We have to right. reboot everything. No humor. No nothing. You know. And I I say you know whatever fits the material and also what 
if you believe in your particular version of it, then go for it. And that's why, like, when I say big dumb action movie, I'm saying that more as like a stylistic thing than rather as like a mark of the film's quality necessarily. Because as you'll recall, uh, I gave a lot of praise for you know that particular version of it as being a good a mm -hmm. good version of the big dumb 90s action movie like it's a good version of it uh better than a lot of people think now this mm -hmm. i think is a good version of the grim and gritty reboot um mm -hmm. you know movie but i would throw in there another more short-lived category which was the late 2000s early 2010s 3d film uh, which that seems that seems to have uh, thankfully the the 3D seems to have gone away thankfully which I'm yeah. like yeah oh, but but, but yeah this wasn't like, three this wasn't 3D yeah well, that's that was what kind I, of like, oh, it's obvious that it was oh, but 3D, a, a right? film oh. a film like uh, <laughs> a film like Piranha 3D uh, Drive Angry 3D <laughs> and this they seem to really embrace what 3D is which is you put shit front and center on the screen and you be really gratuitous with it, you know? Harold now, that's, Christmas special. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like, and that's, the, like, that's the whole point of a 3D movie. It's like, the uh, that that's not counting animation because animation is one where like, I really feel like the added depth because it's all virtual, mm -hmm. the added depth actually goes a long way to making this world look nicer because you do get depth that you don't get otherwise. With, uh, you know, with a live action movie, it's like we already understand what depth is uh, just in a normal image like that because it's a real world that's being photographed. So here it's like, hey, we can afford to like have slow motion quite literally in the story. You know, we can give it a story reason for why it's there. We can have, you know, blood coming at the screen. We can have the character falling towards us and slamming into the pavement and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it, it takes that gimmick and runs with it and makes it a part of mm -hmm. the story um which i think was one of the strongest things about it uh you know and it uh but it it does fit the grim and gritty uh aesthetic it's going for but again i do give a lot of praise for how economical the storytelling is and how because of its exposition being fairly minimal uh we're able to just go and we're able to accept the fact that mutants exist in this mm -hmm. world. We don't even, yeah. you know, think about it as much as we might otherwise. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cause this is ultimately about, we got characters locked in a building. They got to get up to the final boss. How are they going to get there? It is essentially a siege movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, exactly. And incidentally, it's a siege they... movie and a video game. Yeah. <laughs> Which and I and again I didn't I didn't like absolutely adore either movie. Like I, I really enjoyed watching them and I I love the cheesiness of Judge Dredd. Uh you know, but it's like I think both of them, like you said, they're both missing some aspects of what the other one does right, right. in in a similar way to how like I felt that way about every cinematic adaptation of spider-man i've not felt like any of them have gotten it down a hundred percent because they all batman. they're batman same thing because they all emphasize different parts of the character mm -hmm. and truth be told there is no one way to adapt yeah. a character like right. that because they have multiple writers over decades and a lot of different things that get it emphasized or not emphasized or added change whatever so there's never going to be a definitive version of any of these characters not even mm -hmm. superman from 1978 because mm -hmm. that doesn't have lex luthor the businessman because that wasn't out yet in the comics so right. you know, as great of a movie as i think that is and as close as it gets to superman it still doesn't get everything 100 percent. and you know so same thing here like uh you know the 95 film, you know, had more satirical mm -hmm. elements, uh, you know, going into campiness. This one excels in grittiness and action and like street level uh, judging. And one, one interesting little tidbit I want to throw out as far as characterization. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Dredd and his helmet and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but I noticed it. Maybe because I watched this one first. The glass or whatever on this Dread helmet is opaque. You can't see through it. 
but the others were clear. So, like, even if Stallone hadn't taken off his helmet, you could have still seen his eyes and mm. seen his face. And they really went, you know, gratuitous having him take the helmet off on top of it. But that was a costume element they had where I think they got it much closer to the comics this go around because they were trying, you know, because they weren't held up on, oh, we got to see Carl Urban's face, you know. (laughs) And I don't know if anyone else noticed that either, but I, I felt like they definitely had a difference in this one. Yeah, but, they, they very deliberately didn't show his face in this. Yeah. And I well, think that was they, probably a good choice. It um, was. Well, they also, be, even beyond that, you notice mm-hmm. that all of the judges besides Anderson, who doesn't wear a helmet because it blocks right. her psychic powers or whatever, right. uh, all of the judges have their faces not just covered, but just the head area is de-emphasized in the cinematography. Um, like you, it, they cover them. They don't have to bother with lighting uh, their helmets all that much because you mm-hmm. see a lot of a lot of their faces are heavily in shadow. I mean, the best we get mm-hmm. is like close-ups of the chin area, but like other mm-hmm. than that the faces of these judges are very de-emphasized and that's obviously Mm -hmm. intentional um, because they are ultimately cogs in the machine, but it's just, I think Mm -hmm. that was a, well, that was a smart choice for what they were going for. And that gives the, uh, the kudos to uh, Carl Urban much more because as as I said in the last one, Mm -hmm. the last episode that, uh, he's a very unsung hero of acting um, mm-hmm. in a lot of different ways, but especially here, because he's got nothing other than his his jaw, you know, his mouth. That's yeah. about mm-hmm. all he's got for emoting. And, well, he, you know, well, his body, his voice, whatever. Yeah. And he did a good job with his overall physical well, that's 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 what I mean. Is like he puts he yeah. puts his emphasis on other areas that he can mm-hmm. use, and I I read that he had to do a lot of work with his mouth, you know, to make sure not like that. Uh, he had to do a lot of work with his <laughs> mouth to uh, try to have that be expressive in a way that the rest of his face could not be. And I think mm-hmm. it's that plus the voice and the body language that goes a long way with it, but it's just, you know, that's, that's, that's real acting right there where he (laughs) isn't worried about self-preservation as much as being this character completely. And you really get the sense that this dread is not just running away from past trauma, like the uh, Sylvester Stallone's dread was. Yeah. You get the sense that this is a guy who is fully, devoted to the law and, uh, yeah, he's he's fully devoted to it to the point where you know he's not gonna let you know any one rule uh you know he's not gonna let a rule go by you know you get the sense that he's gonna follow the law completely you mm-hmm. see i i look at him as a different type of this thread uh, whereas uh, I look at more uh, Stallone's Dread as sort of a cartoony uh, comic book character. I look at this Dread as just uh, more of a regular human being who is more of an A-type personality who is, you know, he just happens to be more authoritarian yes. in the way he looks it. But as you can see at the end of the movie, he's not all about just the law it's just Mm -hmm. uh he has his own like i say he's just a human being he's more he's more real than the comic book characters Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that can be a good thing it depends on again i don't necessarily Mm -hmm. consider it overly accurate to the comic necessarily but it doesn't have to be you can humanize the character in different ways uh be it like trying to make the character smile like they did with stallone at the end of uh judge dread Mm -hmm. or trying to make this guy more human and kind of less of a Mm -hmm. straight-out, like, Mm -hmm. anger, authoritarian bot like uh, Mm -hmm. like the uh, comic book dread would be. Well, he he, I I made the Clint Eastwood comparison, not just in the voice, but also, like, the way that he treats Anderson is just like the way that the man with no name would treat somebody uh, as Mm -hmm. far as, like, he's not going to stick his neck He's not going to stick yeah. his neck out for someone, but he's also not above compassion either and not above it after they've already proven themselves to be competent, but in a different mm-hmm. avenue. Um, and so that proves that he, 
you know, being he is a servant of the law, law, you know, but he <laughs> is also not he is a servant of the law, but he's also not above knowing the limitations of it or when someone can do the right thing, but also it happens to fall outside of the letter of the law strictly in or vice versa, like the other judges that were corruptible, uh, which and that's that's one thing we didn't get because the other film was more like larger sociopolitical context oriented. Uh, we got to see the council and all that stuff. This we get to see like small scale, like actually corrupt cops kind of right. uh, territory, which we didn't get yeah. to see much of before. And well, it does feel large like scale corruption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's what I mean. Like the other one's better for large scale stuff. This one's better for small scale street right. level kind of stuff. And yeah. they do treat it like it's corrupt cops taking graft or who are, you know, doing other nefarious things. That's how they treat it. And uh, yes, but he's able, so he's able to see that they're mm. not living up to their end of the bargain. And so therefore mm. it's not so bad that uh, this kid, you know, that she uh, lost her primary weapon and, you know, was it, she, and she's able to play on a playing field that he is not able to because she right. is a mutant. And actually um, you're talking about large versus small scale. You could also say that like the humor is also on a smaller scale. I mean, this is a very serious movie, but there are some moments where even dread does get to lighten the mood a little bit with things he says and you were talking about his his uh, relationship with Anderson. I was just going through the quotes here on IMDb, and I was reminded one one exchange I really enjoyed, which is where he she like looked at him and said something to the effect of "What are you wondering?" What I can't remember what it was, but uh, he's like, "I'm wondering when you'd remember you left your helmet behind, sir. A helmet can interfere with my psychic abilities. I think a bullet might interfere with them more." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, but it's like it's very logical what he's saying. He's not trying to be funny, yeah. but there is a little bit of humor there, you know. More subtle. Yeah, you you really yeah. could believe that this guy would say that in that moment. Right. Yeah. I knew he'd say but, that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Well, I mean, it, as um, far as uh, what about the actual like? Um, the story. As far as the actual yeah, movie, right. the story, yes. Line. Let's get into this. Let's get into the. Let's get into the story. <laughs> get into the, the plot. The story. Well, mm -hmm. it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty basic. Yeah. Right. So. Oh, oh go ahead. Oh, go, go, no, I was like, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, I mean, Dred, I mean, Dread takes uh, Dread takes Anderson out on uh, onto her first onto you know she's. He's evaluating her on her, right. on, taking her on her first assignment to this uh, two hundred story tower uh, called Peach Trees, mm -hmm. where which is occupied by drug lord Mama, who's uh, who's who's uh, create making slow, uh, making this drug slow mo. So uh, dread, so dread, and uh, so dread and Anderson get get to uh, Peach Trees. And uh, which goes into lot, which uh, you know they they okay they take they test some. So, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mama te uh, tests. You know she has her guinea pigs taking slow mo and throws them down, throws them down off, throws them off a ledge. It's like an execution, but she yeah. does. Yeah, public execution mm -hmm. to garner. Um, what is it that they say? Respect and show other people like. Yo, example. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was funny. But the, uh, well, the, the interesting thing, we got to talk about our villainess, Mama. Oh, who, yes. What, 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 what know, with mama? This, well, she's, she's kind of the diametric opposite of the villains that we got in the, uh, in the other Perfect. one, because that's more of your standard, like, you know, male authority figures that are corrupt combined with a psychotic, you know, failed experiment slash, you know, domestic terrorist that's being used, you know, for these nefarious ends, which we've seen in other action movies and stuff. This is a, again, large scale versus small scale. This is a small scale person, relatively small scale person, but big within her world. Uh, and she has, you know, 
gone through a lot of hardship. She's got physical scarring. She was a prostitute. She was abused. And then now she's had to carve out her own little place in this horrific world. Uh, and yet the outside world, outside Mega City One would, I guess, be even worse. But we don't we don't really get to see that in this film. But like, um, but like she 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 carves out her own she carves out her own niche in here. But she, you get the sense that she's not to be messed with, but that she also has been through a lot, and she carries a lot of internal and external scars. And you know, Lena Headey, I love her to death. She plays mm -hmm. it like that and plays it very very well. Mm -hmm. I love how cold she is in her delivery like you get the sense that this is someone who was full of love and full of warmth many many years ago and then the world took all of that away from her to where she has none left mm -hmm. none left to give whatsoever and it's not not for lack of trying it's just because you know because it's not like she was born that way it's just she was very clearly made that way and it's like every time she speaks it's like you hear the emptiness inside of what one once could have been a you know warm loving person and it's just not there anymore and it's she played that beautifully like one of the uh you could say one of probably one of the bleakest lines in the first movie is when uh stallone's character is like i had a friend once and you, mm -hmm. you could hear mama saying the same thing but it mm -hmm. would be the delivery would be completely different obviously but I, I, I thought she was very cold and nasty. I felt like she seemed to be having fun. Like, you know, and, and that's kind of an interesting combination there. Like, she clearly was playing a character who no longer has any sense of fun or joy outside of how she can hurt others. Oh, but yeah. She, that whole thing where she said skin them, yeah. I mean, damn. Oh, gee, <laughs> yeah. She, you know, what's funny is that she actually reminded me of a good friend of mine. Uh, you know, kind of a similar, well, the friend of mine that I'm thinking of is much, has much more of a smart ass kind of sense of humor. But like, as far as like someone that kind of has had a hard life and has had to like crawl mm -hmm. up from the bottom and is tough as nails as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, reminds me of that kind of person, but just taken to the nth degree. But, uh, but I, I just, I like that. Yeah, she, she might be having some fun, but it's, I think it's more so that it's not coming from a place of like pure sadism, at least not at the onset. It's like you hear that this is someone that just in her voice, you can hear that this is somebody that has experienced the worst of life. And, you know, this is like the closest to, you know, some kind of feeling that this person has, albeit mm -hmm. causing pain in, in other people. Um, and it's just like, cause you can tell the difference, you know, and it's not like our previous mm -hmm. villains are sort of your standard, like megalomaniacal nineties action movie villain. You know, it's not like that. Uh, like this is someone who has experienced a lot of pain over a long mm -hmm. period of time in a world that continues to dish it out uh, mm -hmm. in an environment that continues to dish it out no matter what she does. She just happens to be the ruler of this little corner of it. And, uh, you know, so I think she played that beautifully. And I just love how much is conveyed in her performance and in what little we know about her. And I'll just bet um, I, I, am, uh, I, I have not personally gotten to watch Game of Thrones yet. So I don't know how she is in that movie. But I get the impression that if this character watches television – that that would probably be kind of what she would watch for light and frothy entertainment. Maybe. Well, I, I remembered Lena Headey as uh, Sarah Connor in the Sarah Connor Chronicles on uh, TV. Yeah. And I thought she was amazing in that. That's how I first mm -hmm. came to know her. And, um, you know, but again, you know, similarly tough as nails woman, uh, albeit mm -hmm. a, a hero. Uh, but, you know, it's, similar she seems to get those characters very well and how to play them mm -hmm. i just like seeing like honestly this person reminded me of if marla singer happened to be a drug lord marla singer from fight club you know kind of a, <laughs> a similarly like burned out 
yeah. like a similarly burned out character, except Marla Singer was much more overtly self-destructive and more of like a, a transient rather than someone with any real ambition. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas this person, she has ambition, but again, you can tell it was something that was learned rather than she was born with that much ambition. But mm -hmm. point being, she gets she gets those kinds of characters and makes her an effective antagonist for Dredd, uh, for Judge Dredd himself. And they don't really play up the uh, sexual tension aspects of it at all. Uh, no. They just play it up as like, this is someone who has total control over her domicile. How on earth is Judge Dredd and his young uh, rookie, how on earth are they going to get out of this one? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I like the fact that she can almost uh, 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 do kind of like a... Uh, uh, remember the movie Cell? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, well, Cell uh, uh, it has a lot to do with like the psychological going into one's mind and fucking it up, you know? And uh, the, the Cell, not, not yeah. Cell, the 2016 yeah. movie yeah. with Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Right. Right. Which I, I love, love, love The Cell very much. We got to talk about that someday. <laughs> were, well, you, were you like when I went to see the movie and there was a, a woman next to us who had like their 10-year-old kid? Um, was that... <laughs> At which movie? The cell. <laughs> oh man! Well, I would have been. I would have been that kid uh, at that time because that was two thousand. But like, uh, yeah, that I I love the cell. But yeah, I mean, I I that is one thing that this movie had that the other one didn't, which is because it's gritty street level. The slow mo mm -hmm. stuff, uh, that that drug and everything. Well, that gives a reason mm -hmm. for an in-story reason for an action movie cliche, which is the, the slow motion, um, mm -hmm. but also some of the reality distorting 3D, uh, the reality distortion with the colors and all that stuff. It gives an in-story reason for it and a pretty good one. Um, mm -hmm. Haven't seen that quite before, um, but I think that was very effective and it gave kind of a mind bending spin to this thing that I really liked because I like it whenever things get really surreal in movies. <laughs> okay. And uh, next. Okay. So let's do our next, uh, next plot point, next plot point. Uh, okay. So. <clears throat> so they rest. Okay. So they rest. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, Dread and uh, and Anderson arrest um, one of Mama's goons, Kay, mm -hmm. uh, whom uh, Anderson uses her sight, her 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 uh, her her psychic abilities uh, to find out what Mama's to find out what Mama's up to, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the uh, uh, the fact that she is the factory distributor of the slow mo drug. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they go in. So they go in and make their way, th make their way up, up the, uh, up the, up the, up the building to mm -hmm. get to the seventy-sixth floor where Mama, where Mama, is, where Mama, where uh, <clears throat> they go to the seventy-sixth floor where Mom, where Mama is operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, uh, when they get, uh, get to that po uh, point, uh, point, she actually like takes out the big cannons and like. Tries to take them out first. <laughs> ends, up, ends up killing a bunch of tenant. Ends up killing a bunch of tenants yeah. instead. In very, it, like, turn, actually turning them into uh, into dog food. Yeah, uh, it actually, wasn't I think her uh, headquarters were a little higher. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's that's like right. the elevator had to go up to the seventy sixth floor in order oh, yeah. to work or something like that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a it tall was like building. Something. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was really. Yeah, I mean, this is like anything, you know, with your major villain right at the top. And this is uh, one thing where I admit, like, if I had gotten to see it in 3D, I get vertigo pretty bad. But I imagine this is one of those movies where the vertigo effect would have probably been pretty intriguing for a lot of people, <laughs> especially when the, when the characters are on are on slow mo, right? <laughs> oh yeah, Which, and I do I do concur with David. If you were to see this on acid, then and it, <laughs> on acid and in 3D, I think your brain would blow up. <laughs> Wouldn't that be some? Hmm. 
Much like the characters in this film, uh, they got <laughs> their heads blown, blown off by bullets. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and by the like. way, but by the way, the uh, because of the stripped down kind of story, and also because of the lower budget, and also because it's not the '90s, and we don't have to worry about making every single thing in the film into a toy uh, for kids, <laughs> even though it's an R-rated movie. Now, because of that you get a lot more in the way of like, yeah, the gun is still has the DNA thing. It's still, you know, voice activated. It's got different settings, all that stuff. You still have that, but like the motorcycles are on the ground. You know, the cars that they're driving look like cars that exist today. Um, mm -hmm. You've got, you know, you feel like characters are not bulletproof whatsoever. Um, and uh, although I do like what they do with the field medic uh, or the, whatever he said, field, uh, you know, dressing uh, for when he does get hit. But it's like, I you know, like the gadgets that he comes with, too. I mean, he's got these ga uh, gas grenades and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and the stun grenades. And uh, in the very beginning, we get the hot shot, which is a bullet that just fires up the inside of the dude's mouth. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I really like that. Well, my, my point being yeah. that you know, this feels like a slightly heightened version of what you might see today rather mm -hmm. than we need to turn every single thing in this film into a toy mm -hmm. for the kids, even though it's an R-rated movie. I don't know why, but when I look at that, and again, uh, Return to Splatter Farm was a more recent film, but that's what that effect reminds me of as to what they mm -hmm. did when... Uh, when the guy in Return to Splatter form actually uh, fires the flare gun mm -hmm. in directly into the mouth of one of the, uh, well, one of the people he's killing. So, right. you know, it's just a, it's a kind of fun effect, I think, when, when you can get it right. Right. So, probably should mention before we go back to the uh, slaughter with the uh, hand cannons uh, that Dave referenced earlier, the, yeah. one of the, what, the reason they have to storm the castle is because they've hijacked control of the building and yeah. sealed it off completely from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and you have that, that lovely moment where you have that vagrant that when Dredd went in, he was like, do you, you know the, um, you know the uh, penalty or whatever? And he's like, yep. And he's like, so you're going to be gone when we come back out. <laughs> but he's, he's still there and he pays for it when a wall falls on him. <laughs> well, I do, I do like, I do like that. Uh, I do like that. Um, dread after they get out and everything. I do like that. He just says it was a drug bust, you know, but it's like, I think, which, yeah, but I think it was a little bit more than that. You had the whole building on lockdown and you had like, well, this, you know, <laughs> initially, it was much more simple. I mean, they were just investigating the uh, murders of those individuals. Right. They mm -hmm. had somebody that they found in their initial raid uh, where they were just, uh, that they used, that they were like, okay, let's go interrogate this guy. Uh, yeah. Especially when she was able to pick up that he was one of the people that skinned those guys. And mm -hmm. it was because of him that they went into the lockdown. Technically, yeah. if that guy had not been one of the major ones, it would not have gone into lockdown at all. They would just let him let, leave. I, I think at, at one point, done. I think someone says, I think I think Dredd might have been the one who said to Mama, if I remember correctly, if he had been killed, you probably would have never done this, right? Or something yeah. along those lines. Oh, yeah, that yeah. guy yeah. had to or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's like if, uh, if we had just, you know, came in and killed this. I mean, if this person was killed, I'd just simply... If he'd been it. executed, Alan. that would have been it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that exactly. Well, and I like that uh, with Mama, like I mentioned, she does do sadistic things, but I think it is something that was clearly learned over time rather than she was born a sadist. That being said, the sadistic things she does are yeah. pretty horrific, like the skinning yeah. and the gouging out of people's eyes oh. and all that stuff. It's like this is a movie mm. that is not afraid to be really, really violent. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's one thing that you could say is either a strength or a weakness, depending on which audience segment you fall into. Because Judge Dredd, the 95 film, is clearly trying to, again, it's trying to check off all those 90s boxes as far as, like, 
you know, you got to have it be accessible enough, but you got to satisfy your action star. And we have to turn every single thing in the movie into a toy for the kids. You can't see the movie because mm -hmm. it's art. You know, it's trying to check off all those boxes here. This is, <laughs> well, this is, much, yeah. this is much more of like, this is an R rated action movie, pure and simple. Oh. And you know, that, that is very effective if that's what you want. If you fall outside of that demographic, then maybe it's not for you. And you know, especially when those when the space for you know seeing a movie or whatever, when the the theatrical space is so competitive, it's like I can see that plus like in ineffective marketing, uh, which apparently this had, uh, that it contributed to its not doing well at the box office, despite being so beloved by a certain group of people. If it had had its own toy line, you know, they marketed it in Happy Meals. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, there you go. But this, this is this is much more for the uh, this is much more for the Hot Toys crowd, the Diamond Selects, the mm. McFarland Toys crowd. Oh. Murder, yeah. murder, murder victims with removable skin. Uh -huh. It is also a checklist movie itself. It's just a different checklist for a different time. That's right. But, uh, but yeah, as Forrest said, yeah, it was based off of that video game that was out. Mm -hmm. At time, which I never played. I never played that particular one <laughs> <I> based off of. <laughs> mm. Well, this is a very video gamey plot, as far as oh, like yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you're in, you got to ascend the tower to defeat the final boss. You know, mm -hmm. almost had a Ninja Scroll quality to me, uh, you know, in that sense, but not as many mm -hmm. bosses. But it was, but it was different boss fights if you think about it, because you had that mm -hmm. big old Gatling gun fight, you had the right. initial drug bust fight. It was uh, just rooms instead of um, instead of bosses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, there can, I can see how you could. I can see how you could uh, kind of classify it that way. It did have some video it, moments. You know what, though, what's interesting is that there weren't as many uh, booby traps as you might expect in uh, given the setup of this building. You know, like that. There, there were some. Traps. Well, we'll be you know. trapped. <laughs> well, Diane, Diane Lane and uh, Juliet Chen. That would have that would have made it more ninja scrollish. <laughs> Diane Lane and uh, the other one, uh, Julia. Uh, is it Julia Chen? Uh, yeah, they're they're uh, not in the John Chen. 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 Yeah, John Chen. They're not in this one, so no booby traps of that sort. Uh, uh. But like you would have expected, uh, you would have expected there to be more booby traps in the given the nature of how this apartment block is structured um mm. and uh but then again i mean the only real line of defense that she has in terms of like that kind of thing is just the of course because it's an action movie there's got to be like an auto destruct mm. option which they thankfully do not do that cliche like i thought they would <laughs> no, well actually they did and they didn't <laughs> because yeah, they had the they had the building bombed, but uh, they didn't go through with the boss as a load bearing boss. No, well, that, well that's that's what I mean. Like they had the <laughs> means to do it, but thankfully they didn't. And I was like, good, you know, we did something mm -hmm. different for once. And uh, well, and also, uh, I'm sure that would have been really really expensive. So they're probably trying to save a little money. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I like what it, that represents because it's dread trying to execute. The law, you know, he's trying to execute the law uh, in a way that also tries to preserve innocent lives at, at the same time. Right. Well, I'd love to see a big old die hard effect. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That would have been great. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, and then, uh, so uh, they can, so after, so they make their way past the uh, rotary cannons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and Mama sends one of her goons, Caleb, to start to look for uh, Dred and Anderson. And when Dred, when uh, they catch up, when they when they cross paths, uh, Dred takes him takes him out by just throwing him right throwing him off the tower in like right right in, in mom like right in plain sight of Mama. Mm -hmm. Just to basically send a mess send a message saying we are the we are the law. Yeah. <laughs> Which now you do get to hear Carl Urban say that he's the law, but it's not with quite the same degree of uh, vigor as the people of the previous film. <laughs> which that is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's again kind of 
par for the course, given the kind of movie that Judge mm -hmm. Dredd was. But you know, even the way he does it there is a bit more uh, restrained and seems more like what that version of Dredd would, how he would say it. Hmm. Right. And then right. Uh, Dread uh, Dread Cat catches up to another to another goon, and beats him beats him up for, in for information, uh, which we you know we, again we didn't. That's another aspect of the character we didn't see in the previous movie was he's he's not afraid to use uh, force uh, mm -hmm. against again, uh, against uh, for uh, to get answers from suspects. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we think of that? Well, I, I like that he and uh, Dredd and Anderson make for a good uh, duo, and it's well, they leave it kind of open ended as to what's going to happen to her. But like um, the, I like that they you know one has what the other doesn't have, which you know, and I like that Anderson mm -hmm. is, which we didn't really talk about her much, but. Right. Uh, she, uh, well, I'm about to write. Uh, she is uh, someone who she also because I guess it, it's a little it got a little bit of X Men in there with like the not liking mutants thing. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, she's somebody who I guess did luck out with a particular version of mutancy that was not uh, was not debilitating in any way. It was a strength. Mm -hmm. So she definitely lucked out, but I'm sure she's faced a lot of hardship in her life. Here she is trying to be a judge, trying to, you know, bring the bring the law to the lawless, you know, that whole thing. She's trying mm -hmm. to do that, uh, but she clearly has faced a lot of hardship. She is much more empathetic just by her very nature, by knowing mm -hmm. what the other person thinks. But, you know, she is she doesn't let that limit her it doesn't uh, hold her back or whatever uh she still executes the law and uh she's able to do so effectively Most and without uh i'd say yeah mo mostly much more effectively than one might expect given the setup right. and i think I, that that's they achieve that balance well i think that she dread would probably disagree that she does it well but he, well, I think yeah. he would agree that she tries. But like I think one particularly effective scene is kind of early on where there's the roving bands of goons looking for them and she reaches out and, and catches the mind of someone who's uh, in, in nearby and she leans in and knocks on the apartment door and, and addresses her by name. And because she addresses her by name in that familiar way, they're led into the apartment. And then, you know, the, uh, the lady obviously wants them to leave as soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> but she makes very clear. She's like, my husband's out there. Y'all are going to kill him. I don't want to see you. And, well, they did. she did. Well, well, that's the thing. Like, but, you know, Dredd leaves. And then Anderson looks around and sees the picture of the woman's husband and realizes that that's the person she just shot. And it's kind of like, she has that moment where she's like, uh, he can also it, it utilize really it. But hmm. you're also able to see how, how uh, scarred she is. Right. When uh, she goes ahead and she interrogates uh, uh, the uh, hostage mentally. Yeah. And uh, he thinks he's in command because there's nothing that you can do that will uh, mess with me. And she's like, oh, yeah, hold my beer. Yeah, and, uh, and that's, basically, that's by far by far my favorite scene because it's yeah. quite literally they're playing mm -hmm. mind games with each other. Right. Um, but what I like about well, I like about the scene before that though with the uh, you know don't want you to kill my husband that yeah. gives a very bull I, I was kind of waiting for someone to say that it's like you know she's not doing it for altruistic reasons at all she's <laughs> like I want you to get out of here I want you to. Preferably yeah. not kill my husband, and I just don't want to see you again. And it's like, yeah, thank you that someone said that in one of these movies. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, you see a lot of like good Samaritans in places where you may not expect to see them, and right. you know, this is an example of just a perfectly believable. Just I don't want the police in my house, quite literally. Right. I, I just want him out. Uh, and so I thought that made perfect sense. But I like that. What what I meant by the uh, I agree that I agree that Dread would probably not think she was stellar material 
had he not seen her, you know, her putting her gifts to good use and right. seeing that she could do it in a way that he couldn't, which is the conclusion he ultimately comes to. But certainly in that initial setup, uh, I can definitely see why he would think that. Um, I'm thinking more so when I said that she could do the job well, I'm thinking more so relative to like other psychic or empath characters who they tend to be so overcome with uh, empathy or whatever that they can't necessarily function or as effectively mm, yeah. as they might if they weren't that way. She achieves the balance of using it prudently and allowing it to do her, using it to allow her to do her job better than she could without it. And I was like, you know, that says a lot about this character because, um, you know, that's always the cliche is that someone is so full of empathy or ability to put themselves into someone else's head that they aren't able to execute their uh, their mission objectives as effectively as they might be without. And so this um, was an example of her using it in a prudent fashion, I thought. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. And, um, okay, so moving on. So let's see. So they go up. The, so so Je so Dredd and Anderson continue going up the tap to the tap the tower to uh, pursue Mama. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so they try and they call for back. You know they call for back. They call for backup. Uh, but to no event to no but to no avail. And. Uh, <clears throat> Well, we, we, touched, we, touched on the, we, we touched on the issue of corrupt judges uh, yeah. a little bit earlier. Oh, yeah. That's, where, that's yeah. where that whole thing plays out, which you did not see much of in uh, the other one. You saw the corrupt uh, council members and higher-ups on that front, but you didn't see them lower down on the food chain. This one oh, you three. definitely do. There we go. Another uh, Clint Eastwood th uh, thing with the cor corrupt cops angle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, um, yeah. what uh, I thought that the uh, the the other judges uh, uh, were uh, well, I feel like we're we're going to have any kind of uh, those kind of co uh, cops on the force where they're on the take of something, you know. So, well, but it it shows the cracks in this uh, authoritarian t uh, rule. Yeah. Yeah. And but but just in a less like you know high up on the food chain, more street level way. And again, I think it's it makes the point effectively because we haven't seen Dread without his helmet on. We haven't seen the other uh, the other judges besides Anderson. We haven't seen them with their helmets off, so they still look like cogs in the machine. And so therefore, it's hard to tell friend from foe. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And uh, so, okay, so we've got so Anderson's been so we've got the corrupt we've got corrupt judges. Uh, we've got Anderson has been taken hot been taken hostage. And uh, and actually, one point, you know, uh, one of uh, one of Mama's goons take uh, gets a hold of judge of of Dred's uh, uh, lawgiver, his gun. Yeah, but well, that uh, was the yeah. Oh, you were saying what was that, Brandon? Wasn't that her law? Wasn't that her gun that the guy got to hold oh, up right, because right, right. he was going to shoot her in the head with her gun? And she's like, "Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I'm not afraid because I know exactly what's going to happen." <laughs> yeah, I I love that's by far my favorite scene because that is a battle of wits. Uh, above anything and i like again it's an excuse to have a lot of surreal imagery which i'm of course a fan of but it makes uh, a lot of sense and it also just shows how you know you can fight battles without brute force and it's all about uh you know your willpower and you know your wits and that kind of stuff and she's able to to do that and also just his own hubris because he gets his arm blown off you know um but mm -hmm. uh, that whole thing I thought was incredibly well done. All right. But I like that she also, it's like it's a weakness because she did lose her primary weapon, but 
he also is like, well, fuck it. I'm not going to be a judge anyway, so therefore I can let the guy go who is innocent. Mm -hmm. So again, she's exercising prudency in a way that goes outside of the strict right. uh, bounds of the law because to, to go within those bounds would be to be less prudent. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And... Um... Okay. Uh, she's okay. So then, so you know, they eventually. So, uh, dread. You know, dread. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, dread. Uh, dread and uh, Anderson. Uh, so I'm sorry. I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, so dread and Anderson. Uh, uh, they are ending up here where she's been shot, like at the end here. Um, and uh, he. Ends up having a moment with uh, with uh, with uh, Mama uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, is kind of cool. I mean, uh, uh, the whole finding the slow uh, slow uh, slow uh, slow mo, giving her 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 own poison, and then basically j uh, uh, just giving her her own sense of medicine uh, medicine and uh, and crashing her out. Uh, uh, Off edge and. Not only that, but she's got this uh, this time to watch thing uh, thing that apparently can explode like within a matter of whatever. Uh, she has a she has a dead man switch thing yep. that if my heartbeat stops, this building will explode. And so Dread gives her some slow mo and kicks her out a window um, so that she's out of range of the detonator when she actually dies. And he actually mm -hmm. makes a comment that, that uh, 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 what kind of range does uh, does this have? Can it go through two hundred things of uh, concrete? You know, so <laughs> yeah. Which I and I really like. Well, a couple of things. One, I like the poetic justice uh, aspect of it. With like you said, she gets a taste of her own medicine, and I, I realize just now that what a cruel. Uh, execution method the falling while on slow-mo would be because you're falling for what feels like forever and you know you're gonna die and so you just have to watch yourself descend until you finally hit and i'm sure that they probably feel the impact of of um the concrete in they probably feel that impact in slow motion too so it's probably even more agonizing than it would be otherwise but not only does she get that but it's dread using his wits to say, you know what, I can ex I can execute the law. I can do that while uh, preserving these innocent lives, um, and you know, executing a criminal and doing it in a particularly poetically just way. Um, so I think that was done pretty effectively, and his reasoning behind it seemed to make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, Mar and so, Ma and so, Mama's been, Mama is become has become uh, uh, squash, pretty much uh, squashed like a bug, and In uh, gloriously uh, gr gruesome three D fashion. Yes, uh, and uh, and so, I'm hearing some. I, mean, I think I'm hearing some echoes on someone. Yeah, yeah, I am too. Anyway, um. Anyway, so Anderson, so Anderson uh, feels uh, deci decides that she's not going to be a judge since she ended up getting disarmed, and decides to and decides to uh, decides to take decides to take and ends up uh, leaving. And uh, when the chief judge shows up to ask Dread about her perform about her performance, he gives he t he gives her a pass. Right. Well, this was another one of his good lines. She's like, "So what happened in there?" drug bust. Looks <laughs> like you've been through it. Perps are uncooperative. Yeah. <laughs> that, seems, that seems like a very Judge Dreddy thing to say. Uh, well, but what I liked about the whole she passed thing is like, you're not you know, there's still a little bit of doubt as to whether he would actually, you know, give say her that. a pass. But, well, but I think uh, based on everything that we talked about, I think he, it makes sense why he would. But also, even if he did pass her, you kind of wonder, would she even still take it uh, based on what else she's been through? Because it mm -hmm. seemed like uh, 
with her, it seemed like it was kind of like a personal sense of shame that she did get her uh, primary weapon taken away and did, you know, fail and that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I do kind of wonder if she would take it, uh, even if he passed her. Plus, um, even the empath, uh, in the very beginning when she actually kill, uh, killed that one victim, which uh, is she f uh, found out later what uh, was attributed right. to that one, uh, one lady, um, right. she had a very human reaction to, uh, to, uh, to that, whereas the judge, uh, the, whereas the dreads, they apparently have like zero uh, empathy for uh, for anything except for laws, you know. And Part of me wonders, and I wonder if the people who know the the character better would would agree with this. But I wonder if one of the reasons he passed her is because she was showing such reticence at the end about being a judge, like you know, because she she did have a conscience, she did have that sense of humanity and i could actually based on this movie i get the feeling that he respected that and felt like maybe she might be worth keeping around for a bit just to see if only to see what would happen you know one well, and also that she exercise prudency even beyond the scope of the law, which right. he is even seeing has its limitations because the corrupt judges can exist and thrive despite she still, everything. She still did her best to do the job. She mm -hmm. hung in there. She stayed with it, even though she thought she failed right away. She, she hung in there. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, I look at it more as a camaraderie thing, but this is more right. one of the things. I look at this as more of a of an action, not that different from say Stallone's action at the very end of uh, Judge Dread. Not necessarily characteristic of the character himself, but at the same time, uh, gives that extra human characteristic mm -hmm. to that character. You know, the I idea of you'd say that. Oh, a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> so, ultimately, uh, what do we want to uh, do? We, did we want to talk about special effects or have we pretty much touched on that? I think we, we should probably talk about some you know, so the awesome effects. Like, yeah, it's a real spectacle. Uh, especially <laughs> the promo sequences. Like, those are so good. Well, I was going to say the effects in this film outside of maybe some establishing shots with like the city and that sort of thing, the effects budget clearly went towards, well, staging very good practical action scenes and obviously the 3d gore. and, and the gore, the, uh, and you know, how to show that in deliberately gimmicky 3d. Um, yeah, so that's clearly where it went rather than necessarily massive uh, vehicles or set pieces or t being toyetic as was uh, called as it was called in the 90s. Um, you know, it, it's being put towards, you know, the areas that were important to them. And I think very effectively, you can tell that this was shot more on location with like real places and stuff or anything that they did design it blends well with what I'm sure was also real places. And, um, and that was actually a point I was going to make, like the, the, uh, the building itself almost is a character in this, and they did a yeah. really good job with the location, I think. Uh, mm. I, I would say that most of the effects held up very well. I mean, uh, the building yeah. definitely. Uh, I will say that one of the things that I know uh, many of y'all looked at as one of the major amazing graces of this was the whole 3d effects but i think that much like a lot of much like old cg effects i do think that as time goes as we've moved away from uh 3d effects that that will be looked at as more of an annoyance than anything else because mm. again, i never watched this in 3d but I look at this and like this is pandering to 3D. Yeah, uh, well, I, did, I didn't even 3D. think about that. Oh, I, 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 I didn't even think about it. 
Hmm. Well, I, I think I, I agree. I kind of agree with both of you in different respects because I think that the, uh, yeah, it is playing to the 3D craze of the time, but it's doing so in a way that acknowledges that, yeah, 3D is a gimmick. And so let's, you know, put all the blood and guts up on the screen, shove it right in your face and do it in a way that makes sense relative to the story to where even if you don't have the 3D glasses, it makes sense because you have the slow-mo in the story. Um, and also partially it is just a stylistic choice to do slow motion violence and that kind of stuff. Uh, but again, it's justified in the story in a way that other action movies from like 2000s and especially 2010s, the way that they hadn't done in quite the same way. But I, and I, it did work for me even not seeing it in 3D, but I can imagine that seeing it in 3D would have made those pop even more. I do think it works even without it. Um, but I think, uh, it takes what was a gimmick of the time and it goes all the way with it and actually integrates it into the story in a way that makes sense. But in terms of the effects, I think that's really where a lot of it went. It didn't really go as much into uh, costumes, even though costumes are very effective. They're just much more, they're more believable as to what you think uh, these kinds of characters would probably wear. You know, they're more tactical, they're less showy, less uh versace designed you know as much as i love as much as i love the versace designs of course um but it's like you know the, the, this uh the costumes are definitely designed to be worn and yeah and used in battle and that kind of stuff um but yeah that was all very effective uh, the thing that uh I really, really loved about this film because we mentioned music in the last one. I think the music of this film kicked ass. Absolutely loved the music in this Absolutely. film. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's much more, uh, rep speaking of representing the time, Alan Silvestri's score for Judge Dredd, it's, you know, your... Uh, traditional symphonic score but again through the the lens of the big dumb 90s action movie again done very well great score for that kind of movie yeah. this was during that brief all too brief period of big mainstream movies having electronic slash kind of 80s synthesizer re uh, rebirth kind of scores of like uh Tron Legacy, uh, pretty much everything Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross touched from like the social network onward. Uh, you know, this plus like, uh, yeah, that I think that was all too brief of a renaissance of that kind of music. And, uh, yeah, I think it's one of the most effective parts of it. All right. And, uh, okay. And what, uh, and actually, you know, because we need to uh, really touch upon the, other care. I feel like we, we touched we touched touched on Dread and Mama, but uh, did we really talk? We didn't touch on. I think we touched on Anderson. What we yeah, we did. Oh, we yeah. did. We touched on her quite a bit. All we right. Went through, yeah. And well, so we got there. music. We got effects. We That's got. Uh, four. Yeah. We got the music. Okay. I guess we get. I guess now we go. We go. We, we go to. Fa we go to favorites. All right. So. Uh, I liked the, well, actually, it's kind of a twofold bit. I liked the initial, uh, I mentioned my favorite scene, which is the mind games in which she gets him to, or, or rather, she stands back while he does himself in by blowing his own arm off. But, you know, it's all through a battle of, of wits and by literal mind games. I like that, and I like actually the first foray into it with... Uh, him trying to shock her with like a, you know, violent like rape fantasy basically, and and her not falling for it. Uh, but I just really like that it's a it is a battle of will and wits um, where she they're in each other's minds and she, you know, is put put in a victimhood uh, situation through his imagination, but she steps out of that quickly because she's a lot stronger in that arena than he is, um, despite them both kind of coming from fucked up 
uh, backgrounds mm. in their own respects. But uh, I think all of that is done very, very effectively. I have never quite seen something like that done in like an action movie like this. Uh, and I think it was done beautifully. Okay, uh, Dustin, what about you? Uh, favorites? Uh, it's sort of difficult to pick just one favorite thing. Uh, I kind of have two. So sort of the finale where Dread gives her the slow, gives Mama the slow mo and kicks her out that window. Like mm -hmm. that was an amazing sequence uh, where Mama's falling and you see everything in slow motion. And then my other favorite is when the other when the lady corrupt judge is like, you know, oh let me handle let me handle Anderson. Like I, you know, she'll hesitate and then I'll just shoot her. And Anderson reads her mind and just blasts her. Like I, I kind of laughed at that. That was pretty great. All right, uh, Dave. Uh, fa fa what are your uh, favorites? I would have to agree with Dane. Uh, the uh, all, the, all the psychological mind uh, 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 jumping that uh, Anderson was doing. Um, uh, I kind of enjoyed that uh, that uh, that whole montage of sexual interlude uh, uh, that he was uh, portraying uh, her, and he was, uh, and she was like trying to shake it off and shit. And uh, um, I kind of like the. Uh, um the canon part where uh, where she just blew the fucking flo uh, uh, floor to pe uh, pieces and uh, they ended up uh, about the back way with that skate ramp, uh, ramp which was high up to begin with um and uh i i kind of like some of the uh, the comedy uh, comedy aspects where the uh, where the other judge dread showed up and they were like you're relieved of duty you know because <laughs> uh, they were uh, uh, they were like you only did this you know so um hmm. and uh yeah uh, i mean it's hard to pick in this one because it is it's uh, to, uh, to me was like uh, like better in most ways for, uh, for, uh, for, i mean there was just enough com uh, comedy for me to and enjoy it, and I liked the darker um, Judge Dredd uh, uh, more. I, I don't know, but uh. although uh, we had one thing I didn't bring up in the last uh, one that I thought was really smart and kind of courageous of them relative to the time, the opening credits of Judge Dredd shows the real comic book covers at a time when you know it wasn't really cool or sexy to be based on a comic book um so major props on that front right. but it, is kind of, it is kind of funny that you know, here this comes out in the time when oh it's super cool and hip to be a comic book based movie and this one is trying to be a lot more like a stripped down action movie uh that people that don't know a thing about Judge Dredd can come in and enjoy, which, I mean, now the other one is is trying to bring in newcomers too, but it's just doing it in a different way. But, and yet it did pay homage to the fact that it is based on a comic book, which I thought, hey, that was pretty uh, ballsy of them relative to the time. Okay. And, uh, and Brandon, favorites? Uh, I don't really know if I have a favorite per se, at least not, not any that haven't been mentioned. Um, I, I guess I'll put in that any time that the building itself would shine, showing the different stores and outlets and facets that make up these community centers. Okay, uh, Jake, favorites? Uh, I'm not sure this one has any clear favorites either. Um, I mentioned a couple of the particular dialogue exchanges that I enjoyed. I did like the little sequence where Anderson was kind of, you know, screwing with that dude in his brain. You know, that was kind of fun. Um, and again, that one little moment where she realizes that she just killed the person's husband. I thought that was just like a, it was a real sad moment, but it was like a really good, effective moment. Um, um that's probably the parts I would mention. Um, yeah, nothing that like leaps out way ahead of the pack, but 
Well, this this movie as a whole, because of the way it's structured and the way it moves, the scenes do just kind of naturally follow one after the other, and it, it all flows very much in sequence. <coughs> And uh, was that was that it, Jake? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, for me, yeah, there's a lot of yeah, there's just a lot of good things to pick out from this. Um, I get, I for, uh, for definitely, I would definitely say the cost, the costumes look great. Um, I definitely like the grittier, the uh, grittier, grindier tone and look of this movie. Uh, actually, actually, I'm gonna go with the slow, with the slow, with the slow mo, with the uh, the slow mo uh, moments. When uh, the characters are high, are on the are on slow mo, when, when characters are on slow mo, oh, that was really well done. That, that was really well done. And also when jo when Anderson's go when Anderson's lawgiver goes off on that on uh, on her kidnapper. All right, I think that's I think I think it's I think it's everybody. Right? Yep. Yep. Alrighty, so um, why don't we go with our outros and uh, uh, tell us, uh, tell them uh, our audience exactly who we are. So uh, let's start with uh, you, Forrest. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and what you do? All right, I'm uh, Forrest Bank. I'm uh, I'm an indie film producer based in Long Island. Uh, actually, have some have some have a couple ones coming out soon. Uh, uh, Camp Murder, and uh, then later this summer, uh, Bloody Summer, uh, uh, Bloody Summer Camp. Ooh. Mm. Nice. Uh, go, uh, going over to uh, you, Dustin. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, uh, I'm Dustin. I'm a horror collector living here in Milwaukee. I have a channel for my horror collection where I show off um, my monthly pickups at the crypt of horrors here on youtube i also have an instagram the crypt of horrors that i sometimes post to uh, i've been pretty busy with school so i haven't updated anything for a while um but hopefully um we're gonna see some light at the end of the tunnel pretty soon um and you can also follow me on twitter at der cryptaxis where i'm pretty active so uh yeah Alrighty, uh, let's uh, go over to you, Brandon. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What you do? Well, Septum Sen of Septum Sen versus the world. We love our physical media on our channel. Uh, we do collection and pickup videos. Uh, YouTube decided to strike down our pickup video this week, so we're going to resolve it uh, next week, maybe with an addition or two. But. Uh, We've been doing uh, things off and on. Uh, we're prepping for uh, a couple of big things in the future, uh, Oscar-related and uh, off and Oscar-related. So that's going to be some fun stuff. <laughs> also doing some uh, video game stuff. I have my uh, what I call my clumsy video game uh, playthroughs where I go through my Steam library and uh, look through that uh, all and uh, we do have a video up uh, where I badly play the 11th hour because it's been so darn long <laughs> that I can't remember how to solve the puzzles. And uh, uh, and it's going to be uh, interesting. But I also did a, uh, a recent um, video uh, for the Anhedinia Project where I ranked all of the uh, films uh, from Anhedinia Films. And uh, I plan on actually doing a review once I can get the time to film it uh, of um, Butler's Parlor, the uh, little uh, Western series that was done on YouTube. So if you want to see that series before I get to my review, um, feel free to check it out. As far as uh, Inside Movies Galore, I do work with them on uh, trying to help set the schedule. Uh, of course, our uh non superhero comic book month is over but that doesn't mean the fun ends here as april uh, i posed the question to our viewers to see what 
you decided. You guys got to pick what we watch. And it's a and, smooth spot for sure. And Audience April appreciation. Be, <laughs> yes, and April is going to be fun. We're going mm -hmm. to end out April, of course, with An Amazing Collectors, Inc., uh, as they chose Grave of the Fireflies and The Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya, which our channel is going to also help honor by covering the series, uh, The uh, Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, to accompany. And, uh, of course, uh, then Moe's Tavern, uh, where they picked uh, the film... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, and uh, Alien, which I am surprised we haven't covered that in all the time we've been here. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Movie Collectors, who uh, helped us out with uh, Saving Private Ryan and The Green Mile. And then, of course, uh, next week, we have uh, Talk Movies with Us's picks, which were... Pulp Fiction and Whiplash, and nice. uh, Whiplash yes, being the pre-show nice. and Pulp Fiction being the main show. So mm -hmm. some uh, very fun and intense stuff coming up. So I hope mm -hmm. you all uh, will join us as we celebrate all of you mm -hmm. out there listening to us. Nothing more intense than TMNT two. All right, <laughs> and, uh, I'm headed out of here. So y'all have a good night. Okay, good night. All right. Uh, Dane, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? I'm Dane Kyle, a filmmaker, and I do some Blu-ray unboxings on a channel called uh, Indie Horror Film Creative, which is a show called uh, Blu-ray Views, and need a, I need to really rebrand everything now that I've kind of gotten to a more or less stable place in my life, because uh, I was not in a stable place in my life for quite a long time and so now I think I'm in a position where I can rebrand everything and just decide what I want to do and who I want to be but um, you know also trying to get some film projects started now that you know hopefully the light will be at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the pandemic but uh, hmm. yeah th thanks for everybody for because uh, this was my um, month suggestion the topic I think it turned out to be a really good one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, uh, so. How about uh, you, Jake? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, I co-host on Septum Sin versus the World, and uh, well, Brandon already covered a lot of it. But um, as he said, we 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 unfortunately got a little bit shafted this week, which is why we're down a video. But uh, these things happen. But <laughs> I am also, you know, an avid collector of movies, anime, all this kind of stuff. Definitely check out, I'm sure he mentioned, and I just zoned out because it's late, but definitely check out this week's discussion where we go on with Dave and uh, Animazing's Roger and talk about Steins Gate. And that was a really fun discussion. We had, we had good times with that. And I know next week, I think, we'll be doing a Spandex Heroes, so... Everyone come along and bring your social distancing llamas with you for that. Mm. Uh, and then the uh, uh, we've got upcoming uh, our own award show towards summer, and I look forward to that. But meanwhile, mm, yeah, that's all I got to say tonight. <laughs> Alrighty, and uh, my name is David Stregi. I'm one of the founding fathers of uh, Inside Movies Galore. Uh, where we discuss uh, films of all kinds uh, uh, and all genres. And uh, hopefully you have enjoyed uh, listening to our ramblings on these uh, subjects and subject matters. And uh, uh, hopefully you come back with us next week uh, next week because uh, the fun is not done. So, uh, uh, But I also... A moonlight under a different channel called Delusions of Grandeur, where I go on about my own uh, video thoughts and uh, video pickups, and hopefully you uh, you get a chance to check that uh, that uh, channel out. I, I don't bite too much, so um, definitely like, share, and subscribe. I am the law, and it's not <laughs> law. I knew they'd say that. <laughs> <laughs>